Section 2 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 2. Lecture 1. Part 2. The Deteriorative Power of Conventional Art Over Nations now when you were once well assured of this you might logically infer another thing namely that when art was occupied in the function in which she was serviceable she would herself be strengthened by the service and when she was doing what providence without doubt intended her to do she would gain in vitality and dignity just as she advanced in usefulness on the other hand you might gather that when her agency was distorted to the deception or degradation of mankind she would herself be equally misled and degraded that she would be checked in advance or precipitated in decline and this is the truth also and holding this clue you will easily and justly interpret the phenomena of history so long as art is steady in the contemplation and exhibition of natural facts so long she herself lives and grows and in her own life and growth partly implies partly secures that of the nation in the midst of which she is practised but a time has always hitherto come in which having thus reached a singular perfection she begins to contemplate that perfection and to imitate it and deduce rules and forms from it and thus to forget her duty in ministry as the interpreter and discoverer of truth and in the very instant when this diversion of her purpose and forgetfulness of her function takes place forgetfulness generally coincident with her apparent perfection in that instant i say begins her actual catastrophe and by her own fall so far as she has influence she accelerates the ruin of the nation by which she is practised the study however of the effect of art on the mind of nations is one rather for the historian than for us and at all events it is one for the discussion of which we have no more time this evening but i will ask your patience with me while i try to illustrate in some further particulars the dependence of the healthy state and power of art itself upon the exercise of its appointed function in the interpretation of fact you observe that i always say interpretation never imitation my reason for so doing is first that good art rarely imitates it usually only describes or explains but my second and chief reason is that good art always consists of two things first the observation of the fact secondly the manifesting of human design and authority in the way that fact is told great and good art must unite the two it cannot exist for a moment but in their unity it consists of the two as essentially as water consists of oxygen and hydrogen or marble of lime and carbonic acid let us inquire a little into the nature of each of the elements the first element we say is the love of nature leading to the effort to observe and report her truly and this is the first and leading element review for yourselves the history of art and you will find this to be a manifest certainty that no great school ever yet existed which had not for primal aim the representation of some natural fact as truly as possible there have only yet appeared in the world three schools of perfect art schools that is to say that did their work as well as it seems possible to do it these are the athenian footnote see below the farther notice of the real spirit of greek work in the address at bradford End footnote florentine and venetian the athenian proposed to itself the perfect representation of the form of the human body it strove to do that as well as it could it did that as well as it can be done and all its greatness was founded upon and involved in that single and honest effort the florentine school proposed to itself the perfect expression of human emotion the showing of the effects of passion in the human face and gesture 
I call this the Florentine school because whether you take Raphael for the culminating master of expressional art in Italy, or Leonardo, or Michelangelo, you will find that the whole energy of the national effort which produced those masters had its root in Florence, not at Urbino or Milan. I say then this Florentine or leading Italian school proposed to itself human expression for its aim in natural truth. It strove to do that as well as it could, did it as well as it can be done, and all its greatness is rooted in that single and honest effort. Thirdly, the Venetian school proposed the representation of the effect of color and shade on all things, chiefly on the human form. It tried to do that as well as it could, did it as well as it can be done, and all its greatness is founded on that single and honest effort. Pray, do not leave this room without a perfectly clear holding of these three ideas. You may try them and toss them about afterwards as much as you like, to see if they'll bear shaking, but do let me put them well and plainly into your possession. Attach them to three works of art which you all have either seen or continually heard of. There's the so-called Theseus of the Elgin Marbles, that represents the whole end and aim of the Athenian school, the natural form of the human body. All their conventional architecture, their graceful shaping and painting of pottery, whatsoever other art they practiced, was dependent for its greatness on this sheet anchor of central aim, true shape of living man. Then take for your type of the Italian school Raphael's Disputa del Sacramento. That will be an accepted type by everybody, and will involve no possibly questionable points. The Germans will admit it, the English academicians will admit it, and the English purists and pre-Raphaelites will admit it. Well, there you have the truth of human expression proposed as an aim. That is the way people look when they feel this or that, when they have this or that other mental character. Are they devotional, thoughtful, affectionate, indignant, or inspired? Are they prophets, saints, priests, or kings? Then, Whatsoever is truly thoughtful, affectionate, prophetic, priestly, kingly, that the Florentine school tried to discern and show, that they have discerned and shown, and all their greatness is first fastened in their aim at this central truth, the open expression of the living human soul. Lastly, take Veronese's Marriage in Cana in the Louvre. There you have the most perfect representation possible of color and light and shade, as they affect the external aspect of the human form, and its immediate accessories, architecture, furniture, and dress. This external aspect of noblest nature was the first aim of the Venetians, and all their greatness depended on their resolution to achieve and their patience in achieving it. Here, then, are the three greatest schools of the former world exemplified for you in three well-known works. The Phidian Theseus represents the Greek school pursuing truth of form, the Disputa of Raphael, the Florentine school pursuing truth of mental expression, the Marriage in Cana, the Venetian school pursuing truth of color and light. But do not suppose that the law which I am stating to you the great law of art life can only be seen in these, the most powerful of all art schools. It is just as manifest in each and every school that ever has had life in it at all. Wheresoever the search after truth begins, there life begins. Wheresoever that search ceases, there life ceases. As long as a school of art holds any chain of natural facts, trying to discover more of them and express them better daily, it may play hither and thither as it likes on this side of the chain or that. It may design grotesques and conventionalisms, build the simplest buildings, serve the most practical utilities. Yet all it does will be gloriously designed and gloriously done. But let it once quit hold of the chain of natural fact, cease to pursue that as the clue to its work, 
let it propose to itself any other end than preaching this living word, and think first of showing its own skill or its own fancy, and from that hour its fall is precipitate, its destruction sure. Nothing that it does or designs will ever have life or loveliness in it more. Its hour has come, and there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither it goeth. Let us take, for example, that school of art over which many of you would perhaps think this law had but little power, the school of Gothic architecture. Many of us may have been in the habit of thinking of that school rather as one of forms than of facts, a school of pinnacles and buttresses and conventional mouldings and disguise of nature by monstrous imaginings, not a school of truth at all. I think I shall be able, even in the little time we have tonight, to show that this is not so, and that our great law holds just as good at Amiens and Salisbury as it does at Athens and Florence. I will go back, then, first to the very beginning of Gothic art, and before you, the students of Kensington, as an impaneled jury, I will bring two examples of the barbarism out of which Gothic art emerges, approximately contemporary in date and parallel in executive skill. But the one, a barbarism that did not get on and could not get on, the other, a barbarism that could get on and did get on. And you, the impaneled jury, shall judge what is the essential difference between the two barbarisms, and decide for yourselves what is the seed of life in the one and the sign of death in the other. The first, that which has in it the sign of death, furnishes us at the same time with an illustration far too interesting to be passed by, of certain principles much depended on by our common modern designers. Taking up one of our architectural publications the other day, and opening it at random, I chanced upon this piece of information, put in rather curious English, but you shall have it as it stands. Aristotle asserts that the greatest species of the beautiful are order, symmetry, and the definite. I should tell you, however, that this statement is not given as authoritative. It is one example of various architectural teachings given in a report in the Building Chronicle for May 1857 of a lecture on proportion, in which the only thing the lecturer appears to have proved was that the system of dividing the diameter of the shaft of a column into parts for copying the ancient architectural remains of Greece and Rome, adopted by architects from Vitruvius, circa B.C. 25, to the present period as a method for producing ancient architecture, is entirely useless, for the several parts of Grecian architecture cannot be reduced or subdivided by this system. Neither does it apply to the architecture of Rome. Still, as far as I can make it out, the lecture appears to have been one of those of which you will just at present hear so many, the protests of architects who have no knowledge of sculpture, or of any other mode of expressing natural beauty, against natural beauty, and their endeavour to substitute mathematical proportions for the knowledge of life they do not possess, and the representation of life of which they are incapable illustration. Now, this substitution of obedience to mathematical law for sympathy with observed life is the first characteristic of the hopeless work of all ages. As such, you will find it eminently manifested in the specimen I have to give you of the hopeless Gothic barbarism, the barbarism from which nothing could emerge, for which no future was possible but extinction, the other Aristotelian principles of the beautiful are, you remember, order, symmetry, and the definite. Here you have the three, in perfection, applied to the ideal of an angel in a psalter of the 8th century, existing in the library of St. John's College, Cambridge. Footnote. I copy this woodcut from Westwood's Paleographica Sacra. End footnote. Now, you see the characteristics of this utterly dead school are, first, the willful closing of its eyes to natural facts. For however ignorant a person may be, he need only look at a human being to see that it has a mouth as well as eyes. 
and secondly the endeavour to adorn or idealize natural fact according to its own notions it puts red spots in the middle of the hands and sharpens the thumbs thinking to improve them here you have the most pure type possible of the principles of idealism in all ages whenever people don't look at nature they always think they can improve her you will also admire doubtless the exquisite result of the application of our great modern architectural principle of beauty symmetry or equal balance of part by part you see even the eyes are made symmetrical entirely round instead of irregular oval and the iris is set properly in the middle instead of as nature has absurdly put it rather under the upper lid and you will also observe the principle of the pyramid in the general arrangement of the figure and the value of the series in the placing of dots from this dead barbarism we pass to living barbarism to work done by hands quite as rude if not ruder and by minds as uninformed and yet work which in every line of it is prophetic of power and has in it the sure dawn of day you have often heard it said that giotto was the founder of art in italy he was not neither he nor giunto pisano nor niccolo pisano they all laid strong hands to the work and brought it first into aspect above ground but the foundation had been laid for them by the builders of the lombardic churches in the valleys of the ada and the arno it is in the sculpture of the round arch churches of north italy bearing disputable dates ranging from the eighth to the twelfth century that you will find the lowest struck roots of the art of titian and raphael footnote i have said elsewhere the root of all art is struck in the thirteenth century this is quite true but of course some of the smallest fibres run lower as in this instance End footnote. i go therefore to the church which is certainly the earliest of these saint ambrogio of milan still said to retain some portions of the actual structure from which saint ambrose excluded theodosius and at all events furnishing the most archaic examples of lombardic sculpture in north italy i do not venture to guess their date they are barbarous enough for any date we find the pulpit of this church covered with interlacing patterns closely resembling those of the manuscript at cambridge but among them is figure sculpture of a very different kind it is wrought with mere incisions in the stone of which the effect may be tolerably given by single lines in a drawing remember therefore for a moment as characteristic of culminating italian art michelangelo's fresco of the temptation of eve in the sistine chapel and you will be more interested in seeing the birth of italian art illustrated by the same subject from saint ambrogio of milan the serpent beguiling eve footnote this cut is ruder than it should be the incisions in the marble have a lighter effect than these rough black lines but it is not worth while to do it better End footnote. yet in that sketch rude and ludicrous as it is you have the elements of life in their first form the people who could do that were sure to get on for observe the workman's whole aim is straight at the facts as well as he can get them and not merely at the facts but at the very heart of the facts a common workman might have looked at nature for his serpent but he would have thought only of its scales but this fellow does not want scales nor coils he can do without them he wants the serpent's heart malice and insinuation and he has actually got them to some extent so also a common workman even in this barbarous stage of art might have carved eve's arms and body a good deal better but this man does not care about arms and body if he can only get at eve's mind show that she is pleased at being flattered and yet in a state of uncomfortable hesitation and some look of listening of complacency and of embarrassment he has verily got note the eyes slightly askance the lips compressed and the right hand nervously grasping the left arm 
nothing can be declared impossible to the people who would begin thus the world is open to them and all that is in it while on the contrary nothing is possible to the man who did the symmetrical angel the world is keyless to him he has never built a cell for himself in which he must abide barred up for ever there is no more hope for him than for a sponge or a madrepore. End of section two. Recording by Todd Albrecht.